Okay? Hey, Pastor John here. Before the service starts, I just want to tell you that when we get to the announcements right after the prelude, I'm going to forget to tell you that next Sunday, the 19th, is going to be our first ever Zoom online fellowship hour. So right now, I want to tell you that next Sunday, the 19th, is going to be our first ever Zoom online fellowship hour. You'll, you'll get the email with the link sometime during this week, but I just wanted to make sure I made that announcement. So now that I have, thanks, and I hope you enjoy the service. Brought to you by the First Congregational Church of Kent, Connecticut. Mm. And now our worship service will open with our first hymn, 
which is all hail the power of Jesus' name. <laughs> Life and peace. 
For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though your body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit who raised him, a Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also, through his Spirit that dwells in you. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts prove acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Many years ago, in one of the churches I pastored before I came here to Kent, we had a little kerfluffle, you might say, over the organ. Well, well not over the organ itself. The, the organ was fine. It was actually a kerfluffle about a plaque that could go on the organ. You see, what happened was the previous organ had died, and since the church needed a new organ, there was a family in the church that wrote the church a very generous check to help pay for a new organ. And of course, we were all very appreciative of their generosity, but there was another couple in the church who were so appreciative that they thought there should be a plaque stuck on the side of the organ as a permanent testimony to this family's generosity. So I sat down with the family and I said, would you like a plaque on the side of the organ as a permanent testament to your generosity? And they said, we do not. We were perfectly happy to help out the church. We're perfectly happy that people showed their appreciation, and that is all the thanks we need. In fact, we would be mortified if somebody stuck a plaque on the side of the organ. So the deacons talked about it, and the council talked about it, and we decided there would be no plaque on the side of the organ. Until, that is, this other couple went out and made up a plaque. It was one of those plastic plaques that had the, the peel and stick backing. And one day, they just walked into the church and stuck it right on the side of the organ. Well, as you might imagine, there was a little controversy about that. In fact, at one point, the controversy got so serious that the moderator of the church called up the woman in this couple and literally screamed her stupid. And the moderator gave her a tongue lashing that she probably would never forget. In fact, it was so bad that that couple left the church which, to be honest, was not entirely a bad thing. And when she was talking about this sometime later, the moderator said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. I knew that was not what I should do. I knew that was not what God wanted me to do, but by God, it was what I wanted to do. And I didn't talk to any of you about it because I knew if I did, you would talk me out of it. And I wanted to scream her stupid so badly that I would not let anything get in my way. And I suppose, if we're going to be honest, we've all had moments like that. It may be not moments where you scream somebody stupid over an organ. That, that doesn't happen very often. But I mean a moment where you did the wrong thing. And you did it knowing full well that it was the wrong thing when you did it. But you did it anyway simply because you wanted to. Like I said, I suppose we've all had our moments like that. And that might put you in mind, in fact, of what we were talking about last week. You might remember last week we talked a little bit about part of chapter 7 of Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And in the part of the chapter that we talked about, Paul talked about sort of a, a, a fundamental division that he sensed within himself. But Paul said, it seems to me that it's almost like I'm divided against myself. There's a part of me that knows what I'm supposed to do and sincerely wants to do it. But there's this other part of me that just doesn't seem to care. There's this other part of me that just wants what it wants when it wants it, and it doesn't care what it has to do to get it. That, Paul said, was his big conflict, and I said last week that it's, it's probably a conflict that is common to all of us. There are probably all times when we feel divided against ourselves like that. There are times where we know what we're supposed to do, times where we may even want to do what we're supposed to do, but times where there's that other part of us that just somehow seems to prevent us from doing it. When you go through a situation like that, you, 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 might, you might think about what Paul says 
at the end of the reading, Paul ends the, ended the reading last week by saying, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin? Or, to put it the way we might put it, why do I keep doing this stuff? And what can I do about it? Well, if you've ever asked yourself those questions, if you've ever wondered, why do I keep doing this stuff, and what, if anything, can I do about it? Well, Paul is right here for us at the beginning of chapter 8, because he thinks he's got a solution for our problem. And Paul's solution for the problem is Jesus. Paul says there, there are two things about Jesus that are important for us with this problem. I mean, there are lots of things that are important about Jesus, but for the purposes of this discussion, two things, principally. But Paul says the first important thing about Jesus is that Jesus was able to do something that none of us could do. You see, the problem, Paul thinks, the reason we're always divided against ourselves, the reason that we frequently don't do what we want to do and end up doing stuff that we don't want to do, Paul says our basic problem is the law. You see, way back in the Old Testament, God gave his law to the Israelites. God gave the Israelites a list of rules, a list of things that they were supposed to do, a list of ways that God wanted the people to live. And, and, and from the very moment that God gave that law to the Israelites, the Israelites couldn't keep it. In fact, nobody has ever been capable of keeping God's law. Nobody has ever been able to always do what God wants them to do. No one has ever always been able to do the right thing. And the reason we can't do it is precisely because of that division that, that we find inside of ourselves. The fact that there is, we're sort of pulled against ourselves. There's one part of us that wants to do the right thing, and there's that other part that just doesn't care. And Paul says there's no way that we human beings can get around the law. There's no way that we can do what the law wants us to do. And as a result, we're all condemned under the law. Because the thing about the law is it doesn't just have a list of things that God wants us to do. It also has a list of punishments that God threatens to give us if we don't do what the law tells us to do. And since none of us can keep the rules, Paul says we all deserve the punishment. And that's where Jesus comes in. The first way Jesus comes in is Jesus is able to do what we couldn't do because Jesus was able to keep the law. Jesus was able to fulfill everything that the law said. Jesus was the only person in history who was always able to do the right thing. And of course, the reason Jesus was able to do that is because he wasn't just another common slob like the rest of us. The reason Jesus was able to do that is because he was the Son of God. Since he was the Son of God, he was perfect. And since he was perfect, he could keep the law. He could do the one thing that none of us can do. But Jesus did more than that. In addition to being able to keep the law, Jesus also was punished for the law. He wasn't punished for breaking the law himself because he never broke it. Rather, he was punished for all the times we had failed to keep the law. When Jesus died on the cross, he took on the punishment that all of us deserved for our failure to keep the law. And Paul says since Jesus did these two very important things, since Jesus was able to fulfill the law, and since Jesus was able to accept the punishment we deserved for breaking the law, well, then the way Paul figures it, the law is no longer binding. And if the law is no longer binding, well, then we can't be punished for breaking it. Oh, sure, the law is still helpful. It's still useful. It still shows us what God wants us to do. It still tells us about the sort of people that God wants us to be. But there's no longer a punishment for not being able to keep it. There's no longer a punishment for breaking it. Now, while all of that business about Jesus fulfilling the law is good news, and, and it is good news, it does leave Paul with a problem. Because the problem is without the law, or more specifically, without the punishments that are built into the law, there's nothing left to encourage us to be better people. Because that's the thing about the law. As long as the law threatened us with punishment when we didn't do the right thing, that gave us a certain amount of motivation to do the right thing. The threat of punishment always helps to motivate people to do what they're supposed to do. It's always been that way. It was that way when you were a kid, and if you have children, it's the way with them. 
There are some times, sure, there are some times when we can encourage people to do the right thing by promising them a benefit if they do it. But there are also times where you can motivate people to do the right thing by threatening them with punishment if they don't. And Paul says that's what the law does. But if you take away the law, if the law is no longer binding, well then, there's no more punishment. And if there's no more punishment, what, what is there to motivate us to be better people? Because here's the thing. All of this business about Jesus and the law, it changes a lot. It changes our relationship to the law. It changes our relationship to God. But it doesn't change us. We're still the same people we've always been. We're still sort of divided against ourselves. We all have that part of us that wants to do the right thing. But we still got that part of us that just doesn't care. That part of us that just wants what it wants when it wants it. So if there's no longer any punishment on the law, what reason do we have to try to be better? What reason do we have to, to, to try to do the right thing, even in the face of that internal resistance to it? Well, fortunately, Paul's got an answer for that. Because here's the thing about Paul. You don't get to be the most important person in the history of Christianity if you don't have answers. And Paul has always got an answer. And for this particular problem, Paul's answer is something that he calls being in Christ or being in the Spirit. He actually uses both terms in our reading for today. He, he uses both terms kind of interchangeably in all of his letters, and I think the reason he does that is because no matter which term he uses, he means the same thing. Whether Paul talks about being in Christ or whether he talks about being in the Spirit, what Paul's really talking about is being in relationship. Paul's talking about being in relationship with Christ, or being in relationship with the Holy Spirit. And since Christ is the second person of the Trinity, and the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, well, that's why being in relationship with either is being in relationship with both. And that relationship, now that's a relationship that can help you to be a better person. In fact, that's a relationship that can completely transform your life. But there's a catch. There's always a catch. And the catch is that relationship with Christ or that relationship with the Holy Spirit, well, it's like any other relationship. You only get out of it what you put into it. A relationship with Christ will help you to be a better person. It will help you to be the sort of person who does the right thing, to be the sort of person who does what is generous, what is kind, to be the sort of person who loves God with all your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, the sort of person who loves your neighbor as yourself. But Christ won't do that for you. You've got to invest in that relationship if you want to see anything come out of it. And people have been talking about how to invest in that relationship for, well, for nearly 2,000 years now. There's absolutely nothing original about what I'm going to say now. This is the sort of thing that preachers have been saying for 2,000 years. But we've been saying it for so long because it always works. If you want to invest in that relationship, there are some very simple things that you can do. One of the things you can do is what we're doing right now. You can join together for worship. Worship has always been a fundamental way that people grow in that relationship with Christ or in that relationship with the Spirit. And yeah, sure, worship is a little bit different now since we have to do it remotely and we have to do it online, but it's still worship. Jesus says, wherever two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst. It doesn't matter if we're gathered together in one space or if we're gathered together all over the world, Jesus is still in our midst. And that's why worship is one of the most important ways you can invest in that relationship. Yeah, but there are other ways you can do it too. One of the things you can do is spend more time in the Bible. Spend more time reading the Bible. Spend more time thinking about it. After all, the, the Bible is the place where we learn about Jesus. The Bible is the place where we learn about the law. The Bible is where we learn about all the ways that God has related to his people over the centuries. So if you want to know what it's like to be in a relationship with God or with Christ or with the Spirit, the Bible is one of the best places to look. And you know, here at church, we can help you with that because we've got our weekly Bible study. You can just get together with us on Monday evening at 6, and, and you can help us. You can join us in spending that time in the Scripture and, and, and spending our time thinking about what it means to be in that relationship with Christ or to be in the Spirit. Now, there are other ways 
You can do that too. You just don't have to come to Bible study. An important way to do it is spending time in prayer. Sure, the, the sort of prayer where you talk about God to God, about all the things you need, but also the, time, the sort of prayer where you spend time just sitting and listening to hear maybe about what God is saying to you. We could also help you with that here at church. There's nothing that keeps us from starting a sort of online prayer group. We could start a group where people get together to talk about their lives, to talk about what's going on in their lives, to ask for prayer for themselves and, and to pray for one another. We don't do that sort of thing now, but it's certainly the sort of thing that we could do. And since we do it online, you wouldn't even have to come to church to do it. Another thing we could do in the same way is maybe we could put together a, a reading group. Yeah, that's another way over the centuries that people have developed a stronger relationship with Christ, a way that people have lived in the Spirit. You know, spending time reading good, solid spiritual books, that's another thing we could do. The bottom line is here at church, we're willing to do whatever we can to help you develop that relationship. We'll help you with the Bible study. You want to start a prayer group? We'll do that. You want a book reading group? We can do that too. We'll, like I said, we'll do whatever we can to help you develop that relationship, to help you to live in Christ or to live in the Spirit. But we can't do it for you. We can help you do it. But ultimately, you're the only person who can make the decision to invest in that relationship. Like I said, we can help you do it, but ultimately you've got to do it for yourself. Amen. Our service will continue with our next hymn, which is O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
And so today we begin by praying for your church. We, we pray for our own local church. We pray for churches all around the world. We pray for people all around the world who are working to develop their relationships with you, for people who are trying to live in Christ, who are trying to live in the Spirit. We pray, Lord, that, that you would strengthen them by the power of your Spirit as they do that. That as they work to develop a closer relationship with you, you will develop a closer relationship with them. We also take time to pray for the world today. We pray, of course, because of the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for people who are suffering. We pray for people who have lost friends or family members. We pray for doctors and nurses and medical personnel all around the world who are working in the midst of that terrible situation. And so we pray, Lord, that you would bind up the world's wounds. And in doing so, you would reveal yourself as the way, the truth, and the life in all things. We also pray for our own country during this difficult time. We, we pray for the divisions between white people and black people, between liberals and conservatives, between Republicans and Democrats, between those who have and between, for those who don't have as much. Lord, we pray that you would heal the wounds that divide our body politic. We pray that you would bind us together and to make us one people. Lord, as we always do, we pray, Lord, for those, those folks, folks who serve us overseas, for the people who daily face the greatest dangers for our sake, and for everyone who remains here at home and awaits their safe return. We also pray for our local communities, for the town of Kent, and for all of the communities from which members of this church are gathered. We pray that you bless our local communities and that, that you bless them with prosperity and security. And finally, Lord, we pray for us. We pray for the folks who are gathered together here in the building to work on the service. We pray for people all around the country, all around our area, all around the world who are going to participate in this service at some point this week. We remember before you all those people we know and love and care about. Lord, we give you thanks for your blessings of the week that's passed. And we pray that you'll be with us in everything we do in the week to come. We rejoice today with those who celebrate. We commiserate with those who mourn. In particular, we commiserate with Lewis and his family. As Lewis mourns the, the loss of his son, we pray that you would be with him and you would be with his family. That you would minister them by the power of your spirit during this difficult time. And finally, Lord, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you have heard our prayers and that having heard them, you will answer them as is best for us. For we pray all of these things in the strong name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever, and who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, Father who Lord art in heaven, hallowed Lord, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And at this, at this point in the service, back in the good old days, when we were all worshiping together, this was the point in the service where we took the offering. And obviously, we, we don't do that right now, but I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone who has been so faithful in sending in your offerings. Uh, if you have the opportunity to go to our website and, and download the bulletin, you, you will find in there the mailing address, um, in fact, I, I, I would not be surprised before I'm done saying this, that you see the address actually appear somewhere down here right beneath me. If you have not yet had the opportunity, or if recently you haven't uh, mailed in your pledge or your offering, uh, we would encourage you to do that. And if you are one of those people who has been so faithful in doing so, I want to thank you for that faithfulness and for everything that you are doing to help keeping our church going during this time that is so difficult for so many of us. And now, why don't we pray? Almighty God, we are thankful for the many ways that you have ministered to our church during this time of difficulty, it, particularly for the way that you have continued to, to minister to us financially. We give you thanks for all the people who have been so faithful in their offerings, so people, many people have been faithful in giving their pledge. We pray that, that you would bless them for their faithfulness. We pray, we pray Lord, that... that you would continue to, to make a way for not just for our church, but for all of us as we get through this time, and that you would continue to bless us into the future as you have blessed us in the past. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, 
Why do you join me in singing the doxology? Dances that they've released is the original 
version of Appalachian Spring with Martha Graham and her original dance company. So if you're looking for something that not only has cool music, but is an important part of history, why don't you go to Martha Graham's website and take a look at that. And now, my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. And may the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you, now and always. Amen. Thank you.